Danny is a special person, and uh, folks, he sings good, doesn't he? Amen. You know, I'd, he's my kind of singer. In fact, he's my kind of guy. <laughs> the topic today, today is, here it is, when Elijah and Jezebel ride again. Now, I want you folks to listen up. We're going to consider a prophecy for our times, about our times, that if rightly understood would change the way the church does business. And we are a part of the church. So when we talk about the church, we're talking about us. If we understood this prophecy, it would revolutionize the way we think, live, and what we do. This prophecy is a mystery to millions of Christians. I weigh my words when I say, I don't think that there is one person who professes to believe present truth, who is a part of our worldwide church. I don't think there's one person in a hundred who understands this prophecy. So if this is so, many of us here today in this church at this moment do not understand it. A friend of mine in Sydney told me he was talking to some influential church members, members for 50 years, a guiding force in the church. They confessed they did not understand it. Yet it describes the mission of the church in our own day. This is a message that comes hot from the heart of God. And I want to give today a very special welcome to the television audience around the world. We love you. We thank you for joining us and an extraordinary welcome today to the 3ABN team that come to our church. Beautiful, wonderful people. It restores your faith in the goodness of humanity. So many good people, led by Danny Shelton and my old friend, Danny Shelton, and also Elder James Gilly, who is now the president of 3ABN, who is here today with his beautiful wife, Camille. So we extend to you today the warmest welcome. And as we told you last night, we don't just love you, we like you. Would you come over here to the prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6? This is a Bible-reading church and a Bible-believing church, dear hearts and gentle people. Malachi chapter 4. Hold up your Bibles, please, in this church. Hold them up high. Mm -hmm. If you haven't got a Bible here in this church then uh, I don't know what I'm going to say to you, but I'll think of something. Hold up your Bibles and say, this is my Bible. Come on. This is God's Word. God has a message for me today. This message will make me a better person and give me everlasting life. I now open my heart to receive God's Word in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus. amen and amen. amen, and hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hmm. Malachi chapter 4, we ready, folks? You ready to go? We don't want you to go, we want you to stay here. Malachi 4, 5, and 6, see, I send you the prophet Elijah, the last book in the Old Testament, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land uh, with a curse. The Bible tells me that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, the Bible tells me Elijah will return. Going to write it up. Elijah, the prophet of God, will return to this planet with a message that comes hot from the heart of the God of creation. And if you and I want to be in the right place where God wants us to be, then today we need to understand this message because it's a matter of life and death. Please turn to every text. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 is the first passage. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, it talks about the days of Elijah. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead 
said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. He confronted an apostate church leader because Ahab was not only the king, he was the leader of the church of Israel. Who was Elijah? Listen to these words. Elijah was charismatic, the gifts of the Spirit, controversial, plain spoken, non conforming, courageous, non yielding, and independent spokesman for God. These very words make modern religionists cringe because they are so far from God. He was a man sent from God, but usually today we do not want men sent from God. We want whispering hopes. We want church politicians. But he was a man sent from God. He was a reformer who demanded reformation in a corrupt church. In today's parlance, he was politically and religiously incorrect. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now come to 1 Kings chapter 16. And if you've got an amen in there, let it out, because if you keep it inside, it's going to hurt you. 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse uh, 29 and onwards, it describes the times of Elijah. Got it? It says, in the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, Ahab son of Omri became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab son of Omri did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, but he also married... Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. You say, he was a bad man. He was and he did bad things. And the Bible says he provoked the Lord to anger. In today's age, we do not like to talk about the anger of the Lord. But I want to tell you something. The Lord's anger is going to be poured out upon those who apostatize from the holy truth and lead God's people into sin. Don't forget it. He married a wicked woman, beautiful, seductive, persuasive, and unscrupulous, Jezebel. And as you read the story, it's obvious that she wore the pants. Ahab was weak. He did what his wife told him, and he was the quintessential crybaby. When he didn't get what he wanted, he went home and turned his face to the wall and cried until Jezebel came and said, What's wrong, honey? I'll get it for you. Israel was in apostasy. Look at chapter 14, verse 23, 24. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. And you can read on. In chapter 21 and verse 25, Chapter 21 and 25. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. If you've got a good wife, you ought to say, thank God. Amen. But he had a wife who led him down to evil. They were worshipping pagan gods. We're talking here about Israel. They were engaging in vile sexual practices, is anything new. They were breaking God's commandments, including God's holy Sabbath. Jezebel had her own religion that persecuted and murdered 
the preachers of God and the prophets of God. We're not going to turn up the text. But she was murdering the prophets of God and they were hidden by a wise man in a cave. And God was angry. And he sent a drought that lasted, we're told, in the book of James for three and a half years. I wish I could go into all the typology. But there was a drought that lasted for three and a half years when church and state joined together and the saints of God were persecuted and then came the man of God. Amen. And the man of God was in the minority. If you're in the majority, the odds are you're on the side of the devil. God's man. Now let me give you a summary of the days of Elijah. The reign of Ahab, the leader of the state, and Jezebel, the leader of the apostate church. It was all mixed up. The great apostasy, the forsaking of God's commandments, and the practice of heathen rites. Look at chapter 18, verses 16 and onwards. Chapter 18 and verse 16 and onwards. Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? That's what they'll say when you're preaching the word of God. Are you troubling Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. So back here, the people of God were following a religion that didn't come from God. It was the religion of man it was the religion of the sun god and they were persecuting the people of god you see the demoralization of society perverted sexual practices baal worship paganism and then a judgment from god in the form of a great natural disaster the last three and a half years the persecution of the remnant the prophets of god's religion were in the majority and they persecuted the people of god those false prophets persecuted the people of God. And finally, when it's all over, Elijah is taken home, swing down. Oh, chariot, swing down, sweet chariot. Let me ride. And the chariot comes down and he takes Elijah home to glory because he represents God's last church. You get it? He's translated. Elijah was God's man at God's time, in God's place, with God's message. I want to be that man. Amen. Have you got the courage? He was a forthright proclaimer of God's truth. He was the opposite of a spineless, self-serving, flip-flopping politician running for high office. <laughs> he was a man. To Elijah, the honor of God was everything. He burst upon the darkened scene like a meteor flashing across the sky. He was on a mission to restore all things. He was a mighty reformer who called for a decision. And he was honored by God, and God honored him. He was translated without seeing death. And at the end of his life, you'll remember the story on Mount Carmel where all the priests of Baal turned up, hundreds of them. Elijah was the one fearless spokesman for God. And Elijah came to the people and he said in words that you should never forget, if God be God, then follow God. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. And then after the great test, God honors the prophet by sending down fire from heaven. And the people cry out, the Lord, he is God the Lord, he is God. Elijah called for a decision. And as the Anglicans would say, he endeth the first lesson. The times of Elijah. The Bible says, Elijah will come again. Come over here to Mark chapter 9. I wonder if we were looking for a pastor and we had a search committee if we'd choose a man who was like Elijah. Mark chapter 9, verse 11 to 13. And they asked him, Jesus, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Because of this prophecy. 
Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it, is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Jesus said, Elijah came in his day. Now come over fast. Come over here to Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13. I'm always glad to hear the pages of the Bible being turned. I know I've got a good church when people turn up the Bible. Matthew 17, 10 and onwards. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus re re replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. Write that down in your mind. He restores all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him. Did you hear this? They did not recognize Elijah, but have done to him everything they wished in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about whom? John the Baptist. Therefore, John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy of Elijah, but he didn't fill it full. Come over now to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 19 and onwards, and I am moving fast. Move with me, John chapter 1, and verse 19 and onwards. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No, I'm not. So here you have an apparent contradiction. Jesus says he is, and John says he's not. Then how do you understand it? By a comparison of the texts of the Bible, a text without a context is a pretext. Therefore, please turn with me to Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 and onwards. Are you folks glad to be in church today? Mm. Are you really glad? Amen. I'm glad to be here today. And I can sense that the Spirit of God is here today. Amen. Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 and onwards. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. What a good name. <laughs> he will be a joy and delight to you. Well, I guess that applies to all the Johns. It, it, he didn't say his name's going to be Jim. <laughs> he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Just get that into your heads, friends. We want to be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other for men to drink. That is why in this church we do not have alcohol. We don't drink it. He is never to take wine or other for men to drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord, look at it, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's the Elijah message. Now, John was not the literal Elijah, but he had the spirit of Elijah. He did the work of Elijah. He did a work of restoration, and the work of Elijah was to prepare a work of restoration, prepare a people to stand in the day of God. So, therefore, listen, the return of Elijah is not the return of Elijah as a person. It is the return of of the message of Elijah. It is the return of the work of Elijah to restore all things in the spirit and the power of Elijah in the power 
of the mighty power of God. Therefore, what was so significant about what John did? He confronted an apostate Israel who had turned from God and set up a man-made religion. Those people were so entrenched in church tradition that they could not recognize the Son of God when he came. They put him on a cross. Therefore, we who are religious people need to beware. He called the people and the priests to repent. He came with the Spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. John was God's messenger sent by God to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord by restoring all things. And the theme of his message was, Behold the Lamb of God. You hear it? Israel, lift up your eyes and behold. Behold uh, the Lamb of God. He called for a decision. If God be God, then follow God. And he led people out to the River Jordan and he baptized them for the remission of sins. Come over here to Matthew chapter 3. My dear friends, Matthew chapter 3. You know the story, but we're going to read a bit of it. Verse 1 and onwards, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea. Now folks, God is calling his preachers to be preachers, not to be whispering hopes. Preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. The Bible goes on and says, he was dressed like Elijah. And verse 6, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. This is a great get ready message. The Lord is coming. Look at Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. In verses 7 and onwards, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind. A person who blows this way and that way. God help us. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes. No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger who will prepare your way before you. And verse 14, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Therefore, I have established today, number one, that Elijah was a fearless reformer, number one. He called for a decision. Number two, Jesus said when John the Baptist came with a fiery utterance given to him by the Holy Spirit, he didn't get it in the Jerusalem seminary. Did you hear that? I hear Danny say, all right. He didn't get it in the seminary. He got it from the Holy Spirit. And God is going to raise up in the last days people who are endued with the Spirit of God. Amen. So, number two, John fulfilled the prophecy, but he didn't fill it full because this prophecy says before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, let me prove it to you. Come over here to Matthew 17, verses 10 to 11. Matthew chapter 17 and verses 10 to 11. I think it is. Here it is. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes. That's the future. 
Elijah comes and will restore all things. That is the future. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him. Therefore, the prophecy has a dual application. He will restore all things. That is the future just before Jesus returns and he has come. That is the past. Therefore, the consummation of the prophecy happens in the last days. And I'm here to tell you today and the great television audience, unless you understand the import of this prophecy, you will not know what the true mission of the church is. And you'll be wandering around and you'll be a blind leader of blind men and women. So I want you to listen. I ask you the question. The pertinent question, are we living in the last days? I tell you what, I've got a burning conviction in my soul. And after the church service today, we're going to give you our, our, a CD entitled Iceberg Ahead. Preached this recently. We are on the Titanic, my friend. I want you to know the signs of the times are telling us with a tremendous urgency the Christ is coming. Amen. He's coming in power and great glory. Christ is coming. If we are living in the last days, I put it to you, we must expect the return of Elijah now. And I would suggest to you today, sitting here in Los Angeles in our beautiful church, with the wonderful three ABN people, the times demand it. The professing people of God have forsaken the commandments of God and they are following the Baals. If you turn to the book of Revelation, you will actually read there. You don't need to turn to it now, but in Revelation 2, it talks about the religion of Jezebel. Elijah's coming back because the religion of Jezebel is back in the world today. And if you'd come over here to Revelation 17, it actually describes Jezebel. Maybe you haven't seen it like this before. But this is the religion of Jezebel. Revelation 17, verse 3, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. That's Jezebel. Verse 4, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet. That's Jezebel. Was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. That's Jezebel. She held a golden cup in her hand. Verse 6, I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints. The blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. That's why I call this talk when Elijah... Jezebel, right again. Let me give you some evidence. I want you to look at the blackboard, or rather at the screen, because I'm going to put up the religion of Jezebel. On one side, you have the truth, the Bible. On the other side, you have church authority. One side, you have the Sabbath of God. The other side, the apostate Sabbath. On one side, you've got adult baptism as John the Baptist did. Other side, you got the sprinkly babies. On God's side, you have the one sacrifice of the cross. The other side, you've got the many sacrifices of the mass. Thousands of sacrifices a day. The true, a sinless high priest. The false, a sinful high priest. Confession to Christ, confession to a priest. Faith alone works. Repentance, penance, God's commandments, the commandments of men, persuasion, persecution. And I declare to you today that this religion of man is not the religion of the Bible. I declare to you on the authority of Scripture, it is the religion of Jezebel. And I could have put up many, many more comparisons. Therefore, I come to this tremendously important question. Where is the message 
of Elijah. As the man cried out, where is the God of Elijah? And I say to the worldwide church, where is the voice of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? And where is the Elijah message? Is there such a message that is presented in the Bible? Come to Revelation 14 and verses 6 to 12. And that is why Danny Sheldon was moved upon by the Spirit of God to start the Three Angels Broadcasting Network. Revelation 14, verses 6 and onwards. Let me read it to you and follow it. This is the Elijah message. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. I want you to know this. We believe in the gospel. We believe in sola scriptura, only scripture. We have only one Bible. We don't have many Bibles. We believe this is the word of God. We believe in sola Christus, only Christ is our savior. We believe in sola, this is the cry of the Protestant reformers, sola gratia, only grace. We are saved by the grace of God alone and sola fide, we are saved by faith in Christ. That is the gospel. We believe in the blood atonement on the cross of Calvary. We do not believe that we can be saved by our own obedience. We are saved by His. Amen. We do not believe that the gospel is good advice. We believe the gospel is good news. Amen. Now, good advice is about what you ought to do in the future or now. But news is about what somebody has already done. And the good news is that God became a man and in the person of Christ, went to the cross and died for my sins according to the scriptures so that if you, if you and I believe in him, we shall live for eternity. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this, my friend, is not good advice. This is the good news. Amen. Now, read on. Read on. He said in a loud voice, oh dear, that would embarrass some people. I'd say, you've got to keep it quiet, Brother Carter. We don't want you offending any people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. We live in the judgment hour of the world. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Come back to the Creator. If God be God, then follow God. If out of Baal, then follow Him. We do not believe that we are the end result of a long process of evolution. We do not believe that we are a product of time plus matter plus chance. We believe that we were made in the image of God. You hear this? And because I came from the hand of God through Christ, one day I shall return to God. Amen. You hear this? A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. This is false religion. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, I'm told don't preach that. I've been told you're not allowed to preach that. I've been told we won't uh, broadcast you if you preach that. But I want you to know by the grace of God, I will follow Christ rather than man. Amen. You hear what I'm telling you? And that is why I am glad to be on a television station that is preaching in the words of Danny Shelton the undiluted truths of the three angels' messages, God saved me from being a whispering hope. Amen. Mm. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me read on. 
If anyone worships the beast in his image, I say, you don't preach that, do you? Of course I do. I preach it in love. Why? Because it is the Word of God. I do not want to be a coward. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. Oh, what a terrible sin to refuse to preach that message. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This is God's last warning message. Who dare to tell a preacher the gospel? He should not preach that. He will bring upon himself the wrath of God. This calls for patient endurance. As my mother said, you should always pray the prayer, John, help me to be patient. <laughs> this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. That, my friend, uh, I tell you, in the name of God, is the Elijah message. It is, listen, a warning message. It is a restoration message. It is a clear message. It is a powerful message. The reason some people don't preach it is because they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit or because they're afraid of becoming unpopular with the world. I would not want to be a priest of Baal in this tremendous hour. It is an uncompromising message, a Christ-centered message, behold the Lamb of God. It is a great get-ready message to prepare a people to stand uh, in the day of the Lord. It is for many a disturbing message. It is a saving message. It is a message of warning, hope, joy, and glad tidings. The preaching of that message with the power and the spirit of Elijah is the return of the prophet Elijah. So he returns, not in a super personality. You won't see Elijah walking down the streets but he comes back in the spirit and the power of that mighty message. And that message is going to prepare a people to stand in the day of God. That message, my friend, is going to call out a people like John the Baptist who will neither drink wine nor strong drink, but they will be filled with the Holy Ghost from their mother's wombs. We are told in the Bible, I say to every pastor watching this, pray that you will be faithful to God, that you will be God's man. What is the message of the true remnant? Now listen up. It is not to babysit a sleeping church. It is not to please the world or even church leaders. And certainly it is not to please the enemies of truth or the great antichrist of Bible prophecy. We are not called to be popular. We are called to be faithful to God. We are not called to preach a popular social gospel. We are not to water down the truth and sell our souls to the devil. But to fearlessly proclaim the undiluted truths of the three angels' messages to prepare a people in the day of God. If I only had time, if you understand this, 
It's going to put a fire in your soul. There you have 1260 days. That's the time of the reign of Jezebel. The persecution of the saints. And then you have decision time. And Elijah comes. The man with a message hot from the heart of God. And he says, if God be God, then follow him. Amen. And he calls the people out of spiritual apostasy to follow the Creator, behold the Lamb, and to keep the commandments of God, including the sacred seventh-day Sabbath. Amen. So help me God. I have here the book, Prophets and Kings. I want to read you what this wonderful person wrote. The spirit of worldliness may contaminate the many and control the few. The cause of God may hold its ground only by great exertion and continual sacrifice, yet in the end uh, the truth will triumph gloriously. Say amen. amen. In the closing work of God in the earth, the standard of His law will again be exalted. False religion may prevail, iniquity may abound, the love of many may wax cold, the cross of Calvary may be lost sight of, and darkness like the pall of death may spread over the world. The whole force of the popular current may turn against the truth. Plot after plot may be formed to overthrow the people of God. Now listen. But in the hour of greatest peril, the God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not be silenced in the populous cities of the land and in the places where men have gone to the greatest lengths in speaking against the Most High, the voice of stern rebuke will be heard. Boldly will men of God's appointment announce the union of the church and the world. Earnestly will they call upon men and women to turn from the, the observance of a man-made institution to the observance of of the Holy Sabbath. Fear God and give glory to Him they will proclaim to every nation for the hour of His judgment is come. Worship Him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. If anyone worship the beast and his image. And I've been told on several occasions I would be fired. If I preach that message, I want those people to hear today, by the grace of God, we plan to keep on keeping on because we have the blessing of God. And you know what's going to happen? Well, <laughs> it's good news. We're in for a time of fireworks. If you think we've had persecution, we haven't had anything. If you think things are t hard, we haven't seen anything yet. Jezebel is going to write again. The great conflict is going to come. And the message is going to go to the world. How long halt ye between two opinions? Here. Yeah. How long halt ye between the two, two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him, and if Baal, then follow him. And after the great conflict, you know what's going to happen? A chariot is going to swing low. Mm -hmm. And like Elijah, the people are going home to glory. Swing low, sweet chariot, stop and let me ride. The chariot is coming, my friends. Amen. And I wish today, I hope this has been plain. Mm. Most folks say I'm sort of telling them what I think. Listen to me. Let us send a message to God that we will be on the Lord's side. Amen. 
whatever happens, that we will choose Christ first and last and best in everything. Amen. Who will raise a hand? Who will lift a body? Who will stand and say, stand to your feet and say, and lift up a hand. Lift up two if you want to. I don't care. Make it a double whammy and say, by the grace of God, I will be true to Christ. I will follow my Christ. I thank you, Christ, for dying for me. And by the grace of God, I will be a part of the Elijah message. My Father, bless this audience. Bless every pastor watching. Put a fire into our hearts. Bless 3ABN. And we thank you that the chariot is coming. Bless your holy name. We worship you. We praise you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And amen. <laughs>